you're missing the point because a vulnerability only matters if there's a threat. So if you're just randomly fixing vulnerabilities or randomly going in and fixing low hanging fruit, you could be wasting time, energy, and effort on benign vulnerabilities. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome to this week's episode of Life of a CISO with yours truly, Dr. Eric Cole. And this is one of my favorite times because we get to talk about what it means to be a chief information security officer. And most importantly, we get to talk about my most favorite topic, which is cyber security. If you're new to the show, welcome. If you're back, welcome back. I'm so glad to have you. As you know, I am on a mission to make cyberspace a safe place to live, work and raise a family. And it all starts with you. I appreciate you being here because we need to build an army. We need to build an army of people that understand security strategy, can talk to executives and help them understand what the biggest dangers are. So I always like to start the show with a few questions, few examples, few stories, and then we'll jump in today's topic, which is, are you thinking like a CISO? Which is all about, do you really understand the threats and the vulnerabilities that are out there? So I recently get questions all the time about Eric, there's this new AI based technology that came out that can do behavioral analytics, should I purchase it? Or do we need to upgrade our SIM, our security incident event management tool? Do we need to buy this? Do we need to buy that? And that's a question that comes up very, very often. And the way I always answer that is with a question. And the question is simple, but if you really embrace it, you will really start to think like an executive and really think like a CISO, which is this. What is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the challenge or issue that you're trying to address? Because I think way too many organizations, when they look at spending money in security, buying new technology, they do it backwards. And the way they do it that's backwards is they'll read about a new technology, a vendor will come in, somebody will talk to them, somebody will say something, and they're like, wow, that's pretty cool. Should we buy that for our organization? Is there extra money? Is there extra resources that we can use to acquire that? Whoa, 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 whoa. What you're doing there is impulse buying. You're going there and it's an impulse, it sounds cool, right? It's the candy bars that they put right outside the register. I don't think many people go to the store saying, I wanna buy a Snickers bar, right? I wanna buy a Snickers. I've never ever drove all the way to Harris Teeter just to walk in, just to go to the register to buy a Snickers bar. But I will tell you, I'll confess, I know I'm a health guy and I love exercising and all that stuff, but I will tell you this, there's been many times where I go shopping hungry, which I know is the worst thing to do, right? You should never do that. And I look there and going, okay, it's got peanuts, it's got to be healthy, right? Nougat's got to be healthy, right? And I will go in and sometimes grab a candy bar just because I'm getting a little hangry and a little hungry there. But it's not something I intended to buy. And that's why they do that because they know about impulse buy. Unfortunately, if I'm buying, and I don't even know how much a Snickers bar is, I was going to say 25 cents, but I think that's back from the 80s when I was still younger. Uh, but even a buck 50, right? If you're buying a buck 50, that's okay as an impulse buy. You can get away with that. But if you're buying a two or $300,000 technology, that's probably not something you want to buy as an impulse, right? That's definitely not something you want to do. And I know it sounds crazy, but I can't tell you how many times I go to clients where they have technology that's either not set up, not configured or running because essentially it was an impulse buy. Somebody thought it would be cool. The vendor took them golfing, right? It was something they wanted to buy. They had extra money. They had extra resources. And they went in and they said, okay, let's buy it. But then it wasn't really something they needed. So they never actually utilized it to the full capacity. So one trick I always recommend is before you buy anything new, ask yourself, are we using everything we have? 
is everything we currently have in our environment that we've purchased or other people, right? I know a lot of times CISOs are a quick turnover, so you might have inherited the environment from somebody else, but are you utilizing everything that you currently have? One of the things that we do a lot with our clients is we'll come in and assess the technology they have. And it's interesting because we've done this a lot. We've done this in over 70 different companies. And on average, if you look at what companies purchased and what they're actually utilizing, they're utilizing only about 27% of what they acquired. So it's one of those is good enough, good enough, right? Do you have technology in place that you've already paid for, that you already spent money on, that you could potentially use instead of buying something new. So just reviewing, there's two core questions before you start looking at any technology. What is the problem you're trying to solve? And do we have anything that we've already purchased that can solve this problem? And if you're diligent on that, you will start to see that a lot of the things that you want to buy are really impulse items and not necessarily needed. So always let the need drive the decision and not the coolness factor. Not, oh, everyone has this or it's AI or the the vendor's really nice and gave us some uh, really good perks or things like that. It always needs to originate from what is the problem we're trying to solve. And what that really comes down to is what I call the Dr. Cole Magic 3. This is something I came up a long time ago, and it's sort of become an industry standard. A lot of people have used it and copied it, and I'm a big fan of copying, because remember, I'm here to make cyberspace a safe place to live, work, and raise a family, so if you can use my stuff and it adds value, go for it. I embrace it. I've trained up a lot of instructors. If you look at a lot of the top cybersecurity instructors, many of them started by taking my class, and I mentored them for a long, long time, and I just love that because that's how we're going to make a difference in the world. We need more and more people helping, protecting, and securing organizations. So the magic three that I've invented a while ago and it's still very, very applicable today is this. Before you spend an hour of your time or a dollar of your budget on anything in the name of security, you always want to ask three questions. The first question, what is the risk? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? Because if you don't currently have a high risk item, then why are you spending money on it? Why are you going in and putting resources? So you want to go in and make sure that you understand very clearly what is the risk and what is the problem. Second question, is this the highest priority problem? If you look at everything that you could possibly be doing right now, is this the most important item? Because let's face it, in cybersecurity, you're always going to have issues. You're always going to have challenges. You're always going to have problems. And probably one of the number one things I hear from folks that work in security is I don't have enough time. If only there were more time in the day, if only there was 30 hours or 40 hours in the day. But let me help you out. Time isn't the problem. It's how you manage and utilize your time that is the issue. You are spending a lot of time on low priority items and you are ignoring and not focused in on the highest priority items that really matter. So you want to get really disciplined out of everything I could possibly be doing. Is this the most important item that I should be working on? And then the third question, is this solution the most cost-effective way of reducing this problem? Because let's face it, you have limited budget. You have limited time. So if you're going to go in and spend 500K on solving a problem, that means that's 500K that you can't spend on solving another problem. But on the other hand, if you can solve that problem for 300K, and then you can use the 200K to solve another problem, then you're maximizing the value of your investment and really, really uh, increasing your return on investment or ROI. So that third one is really that ROI component is this really the most cost-effective way? And one of the recommendations there is whenever you identify that you have a risk, you identify the problem, and you recognize that this is really the highest priority problem, this problem needs to be solved, and you look and say, do we have any current technology in place 
to solve it. And if that answer is no, then you go in and look at a solution. Do my rule of five. Always come up with five different options. Because let's face it, if you only have one option, you don't have a solution, right? You, you didn't really go in and be creative on that front. If you only have two options, you really have a dilemma. Should I pick vendor A or vendor B? But if you really push the threshold and get creative and say, okay, I got two or three items, and then here's the trick. Your first two or three items are going to be pretty similar. They're probably going to be competitors with each other, and they're going to be right around the same price tag. Then what I want you to do, because remember, I want you to have five for the last two I want you just to get totally, totally creative. What is something that's much cheaper that could potentially solve this? And what is something that's more expensive that could potentially solve it? And all that's doing is getting you very creative to think about the problem to make sure you're addressing it correctly. Because I work with a lot of sisters and I will tell you, one of the things I hear all the time is, wow, I wish I could make that decision over again. I wish I picked a different vendor. And the issue is this, you didn't spend enough time thinking about the problem. You made an impulse rust decision, right? It seemed good, it seemed fine, you had to solve it, you had to solve it, you had to solve it, and you really didn't step back and say, what are all the different options and what are all the different solutions that are out there? So if you're thinking about buying a new technology, go back to my core three. First, say, okay, what is the risk? What is the risk that's out there? What is the likelihood of this occurring cost if it occurs? And is this a real problem? Or am I trying to force a square peg into a round hole? Because that's what we often try to do. We'll try to find a product because we really like it because it's cool and we got attached to it and we want to find a problem. That's wrong. If you find yourself doing that, were you trying to find a problem for a solution? Stop, drop, and roll. Abandon it. Don't do it. It always needs to start with the risk. You should always be saying, we have this major risk and problem, and then that starts your journey of looking for the solution. The second thing is, is this the highest priority? Is this really the most important thing you should be working on? Is this really the item that you should be focusing your energy and effort on with all the other items and resources that you have out there? And then the third one is your solution, the most cost-effective way. Remember, you first want to look inside and say, do we have existing technology that can work? And then we want to go in and do some thinking time where we actually go in and think about the problem and we never make a decision unless we come up with five different options. So if you always get disciplined that before you spend an hour of your time or a dollar of your budget on anything, you always ask, what is the risk or problem? Is this the highest priority problem? And is your solution the most cost-effective way to solve it? Then you'll be well on your way to protecting and securing your organization. So now let's go in and look a little bit at what is the mindset that a CISO needs to have? Because that's one that's been coming up a lot where people have the title of a CISO, but they're really not thinking about it correctly. And I know on previous episodes, we've talked about strategic thinking versus tactical thinking, and you want to make sure you're very, very strategic in how you go about things. But what it really comes down to is you need to constantly assess and understand the risks to your organization and I want to break that down because that's really going to get you to the mindset. What is risk? Risk is really broken down into two categories. Threat times vulnerability. Threat is the potential for harm. These are things that can cause harm to your organization. And vulnerabilities are weaknesses that allows those threats to manifest themselves. Now, it's funny because many of us who've worked in security and have taken security courses or security training or read books, we know that. We know that security is all about managing risk and risk at the most basic level equals threat times vulnerabilities. Now, yes, you can also add in likelihood impact, countermeasures and other factors, but I wanna keep it very straightforward. If we keep it at the most simplest level possible, when you are a CISO, you should know 
and constantly be thinking about what are the threats and what are the vulnerabilities to our organization? Because you need both of those. If there's a threat out there that's targeting your organization that could cause significant harm, but there's no vulnerabilities or weaknesses, then it's not gonna be successful. On the other hand, you could have a ton of vulnerabilities. You could have a ton of weaknesses, but if there is no threat and there is no, no one coming after it, then once again, there's not gonna be any damage or impact to the organization. So this is where a lot of organizations get it wrong and they get it backwards. You hear a lot of security people and security folks talk about vulnerabilities and fixing vulnerabilities and addressing vulnerabilities. I recently gave a keynote and I'll often when I give keynotes, I don't always fly out immediately because it's too close. So I'll fly out the night or the next day. So I'll sometimes stick around the conference and sit in on some of the different sessions and always love cybersecurity because it has such amazing, brilliant people in the field. So I always love just listening and assessing. And I was recently at a keynote and the person after me was talking about metrics, which I completely and totally agree with. However, they kept going in and saying it's all about the vulnerabilities. And you want to go in and fix five vulnerabilities a day and fix the low hanging fruit because you want to make forward progress. You want to show the executives that you're doing and making changes. So his whole argument was, is there's a vulnerability that's going to take you and your team 60 days to fix. You don't have any weekly metrics. So if there's low hanging fruit that takes you two or three hours to fix, you should always do multiple of those every week. So this way there's always metrics that you're improving on. Now the general concept of metrics and tracking and all that, I, I do like and I do agree with, but here's the problem. You're missing the point because a vulnerability only matters if there's a threat. So if you're just randomly fixing vulnerabilities, or randomly going in and fixing low-hanging fruit, you could be wasting time, energy, and effort on benign vulnerabilities. Because if there's no threat, then why are we focused on it? Now, now yes, I, I do get some people go, but Eric, isn't it true that if we go in and we're fixing vulnerabilities, that we're doing some good and eventually we'll fix them all? No, and that's the problem. If the number of vulnerabilities at an organization was fixed and finite. So it was exactly the same, it never changed, and they never got adjusted, modified, it was always the same number, then yes. If you go in today and fix five vulnerabilities, what happens if it's fixed and finite? There's less, and there's less, and there's less, and there's less. So if that was true, which it's not, but if it was, right, then that approach would work. The problem is the number of vulnerabilities in your organization is infinite and dynamic. They're always changing, they're always increasing, they're always modifying. So if you're spending 10 hours fixing a vulnerability in which there is no threat, what we're really saying is you've wasted 10 hours. Because if there's no threat, that means it's low priority to your organization and you didn't fix the highest priority item. If you're going to put time, energy, and effort Remember, it needs to be the highest priority item that has the most benefit to your organization. So the first thing a CISO needs to do is always start off with the threats. The threats drive the risk calculation. You want to understand what is your critical data, what are the threats to the critical data, and then what are the vulnerabilities that would allow that threat to manifest itself. So notice, when we're doing our assessment, we don't get to vulnerabilities until step three. So we don't start with the vulnerabilities, we end with the vulnerabilities. So the first thing I want you to do is get very, very clear, what is your critical data? What is the data that if it got compromised would have a major impact to your organization? And these are questions that you need to ask your executive team. Now you might morph it a little differently. When I'm a CISO or virtual CISO with our clients, I'll always sit down with the executives and I'll ask them a simple question. 
what would you consider to be worst case scenario from a cybersecurity perspective? What, if it occurred to this organization, would be considered a really bad day? What type of events, if they occurred, could put you out of business? Those are the questions you want to ask. And with the answer, you will very quickly be able to assess and understand what the critical data is. So for example, if I go in and I ask an executive, what would be a bad day or what could put you out of business? And they said, well, if all of our clients, intellectual property and trade secrets got compromised, that could put us out of business, great. You know your critical data. If it's more of a retail organization and they say all of our clients' credit card data or personal information was compromised, that could have a huge impact and give our competitors a huge advantage. That now identifies the critical data and the critical information. So if you want to think and act like a CISO, the first thing you must be obsessed with in any organization is always what is the critical data? What is the critical information? And where does it reside? Then, once you understand the critical data or the business processes and or the systems in which it resides on, because remember, critical data is sort of just abstract concept. What you want to do is then say, okay, this critical data in ones and zeros is physically located on a server and is utilized by a business process. And you really want to think business processes. So what are your critical business processes that utilize and rely that information and data that are needed in order for your business to be successful? So it's sort of a three-tier level. You have the critical data. You have the physical servers or virtual servers that are eventually physical servers. And then you have the business processes that support it. So if you're a CISO and I walk up to you and I ask you what are the critical business processes to your organization or what is the critical data you should be able to answer me. If you can't answer that question and you're not thinking like a CISO and you need to go back and do that work because that's the first foundational item. The second is once you understand those business processes, those systems and the critical data, the next question you have to ask yourself, what are the threats to that business process? What are the threats that if they happened and they occurred could be really, really bad? And your threats are things like ransomware that impacts your organization. Threats could also be somebody destroying a server. Threats can be, they don't have to be attackers. It could be a fire that burns down your data center. It could be somebody stealing critical information. It could be somebody phishing an employee stealing their credentials and using it to gain access to the system. Now, when we talk about threats, it's important to not only understand the threats, but recognize that they're broken down into two categories, external and internal. So external threats are ones that come from the outside. So this would be somebody from a foreign country trying to exploit your web server somebody from a foreign country doing a phishing attack against your organization. Internal threats or insider threat, as we sometimes call it, is within the organization. It's somebody trusted within the environment. Now, insider threat is often misunderstood because everybody always thinks an insider threat is a malicious, deliberate insider. Somebody like a Robert Hansen with the FBI or Aldrich Ames with the CIA, where they deliberately and maliciously tried to cause harm to the organization. Now, yes, those do exist and they are out there. However, the one that's more concerning that we see cause a lot more damage is not the deliberate malicious insider. It's what I've called the nickname, the accidental insider. This is somebody who's tricked or manipulated to doing something they normally wouldn't do if they knew their true intent. And if you look at a lot of the major breaches, the breaches in which hundreds of millions of records were compromised, those are often accidental insiders. Somebody received an email 
from what they thought was a customer with an attachment that they thought was a proposal for them to bid on and they opened it up and it infected their system and led to millions of records being stolen or somebody getting an email that they actually believe came from their CEO to transfer money to an account because they believe it's legitimate, they transfer the money and the company loses $4 million. And these are all real occurrences out there. So it's that accidental insider that you need to worry about. Now, here's the trick. If we went out and talked to most people and we asked them, what's the bigger concern to your organization? Is the bigger concern external or internal? Most people think external because that's what they hear in the news. Foreign adversaries, foreign countries, cyber crime, attackers, and other people trying to break in and cause damage to your organization. The difference is this. When you're really thinking like a CISO and understanding what the threats are to your critical data, you need to differentiate between the source of the threat and the cause of damage. Now, yes, the source of most threats are external. So somebody sending an attachment that has ransomware, somebody doing a phishing attack, targeting somebody within your organization. The source of those threats are external. But let me ask you a question. By themselves, do they do any damage? No, a ransomware doesn't do any damage unless somebody opens the attachment. A phishing attack doesn't do any damage unless somebody clicks on the link. So these sources of threats that are external, they rely on an accidental insider to cause the damage. They're relying on somebody to open an attachment, click on a link or take some action in order to cause harm or cause damage. So this is one of those scenarios that you might be focused on the wrong problem. If you think all of your threats are external and you're trying to block, stop, and do that, yet the cause of damage is internal, you're not fixing the source. The source of most threats are accidental insiders, which means if you wanna start to identify the vulnerability, I would say the top vulnerability for most organizations is that they allow emails from untrusted entities to have attachments and embedded links. If I had to go in and, and look at everything that's happening over the last five years and going to happen and I had to pick one of the number one threats and the biggest vulnerability that organizations need to focus in on, that is what it is. Because most of the damage I'm seeing out there, believe it or not, yes, there's some scans. We might want to put unpatched servers, unpatched systems, asset inventory if we're looking at external servers. But if we're looking at individual and phishing, the number one threat is accidental insiders. And the number one vulnerability is that users can receive attachments and embedded links and click on them with minimal to no filtering or stopping those from happening in the environment. So notice, we're starting with what our critical data and business processes are. We then look at our threats, but it's important to make sure that we understand the difference between external and internal. And when we look at internal threats, it's important that we understand the difference between a deliberate malicious insider and an accidental insider. And then only then do we ask the final question, step three, of what vulnerabilities exist that allows these threats to cause harm to our organization. And I mentioned one of the big vulnerabilities out there for individuals is that they're allowed to receive attachments and embedded links from untrusted sources. The other one, if we wanna look at a big vulnerability, are servers that are accessible from the internet that aren't properly patched that contain critical data. That's another example of a vulnerability. But I can only do the vulnerability analysis after I understand the threats, because notice what we're doing with the funnel. We're starting off with the critical data. We're getting down to what are the threats that have the highest likelihood, and then what vulnerabilities would allow those threats to have the biggest impact to our organization. And if we do it in that way, now we're not only thinking like a CISO, 
but we're now focusing in and fixing the highest priority vulnerabilities that really matter to our organization. Now, don't get me wrong. Vulnerability scanning is okay. It's okay to have a list of vulnerabilities so you can align those with your threats. But where many companies make the mistake is they jump right to step three. They don't ever assess the critical data and the business processes. They don't really understand their threats and they just go in, take a vulnerability scanner, run it across their organization and then trust the scanner. If the scanner says it's critical, we must fix it. Right? And I see clients all the time where they take vulnerability scans and blindly just on the output from the tool, they say any critical vulnerability has to be fixed in 15 days, and a high vulnerability in 30 days, any medium in 45 and then low, uh, whenever we get the chance to fix it, we do that. Now, let me help you out here because I've worked in this field for a long time and I've worked for vendors that create these tools and I've run these tools. I've seen situations where a vulnerability tool says something is critical and in certain environments based on the remediation controls they have in place, it's actually low. And I've also seen cases where a tool says something is low or medium. And in that particular environment, based on how it's configured and set up, it's actually a critical vulnerability. So blindly trusting those vulnerability tools is a dangerous thing to do. And you might be spending a lot of time, energy and effort on fixing the low priority vulnerabilities. So change your approach. The way successful CISOs think is they go in and they always start with understanding the critical data and the business processes that support it. They then go in and say, what are the threats internal and external, differentiating between the source of a threat and the cause of damage. And then and only then do they start saying what vulnerabilities would allow those threats to manifest themselves and then fix those vulnerabilities. If you start breaking down your strategies like that, not only will you be a very successful CISO, but you'll also be fixing the high priority items and your future will look very, very bright. Because as I like to say, if you take this approach, may all your breaches be minor. I remember 100% security doesn't exist, but if we take this approach, you'll have minor breaches that you detect in a timely manner compared to major breaches that you don't know about for two or three years. And then just to summarize, as you go through your day, your week, and your month, before you spend a dollar of your budget or an hour of your time in anything in the name of security, always ask three questions. What is the risk? Is this the highest priority risk? And is your solution the most cost-effective way of fixing that risk? I hope you enjoyed this episode of Life of a CISO, and thank you for joining me on my mission to make cyberspace a safe place to live work and raise a family.